Hello, it's Keith here, and this is the sixth in the platform-specific series of my 68,000 programming tutorials. We've reached the time to look at the Amiga. We've been looking at bitmap graphics on all the other systems, and we're going to do the Amiga this week, and we're going to look at the basics of how to set up a 16-color 320 by 200 screen on the Amiga. Now, the Amiga's hardware is a little bit more tricky to set up because there's a lot of configurability about it, but once we've got it set up, it's really quite straightforward to use. Now, unlike the Atari ST, the Amiga works in bit planes. Now, a lot of other systems work in bit planes, but if you're not familiar with them, the way a bit plane works is each byte contains one bit of information for eight consecutive pixels. So if you think of a four bit per pixel image will require four bits to define the 16 colors that it has, then with bit planes, you would have four consecutive bytes that would each contribute one bit to that four bit per pixel color. And so if you imagine we've got our eight pixels here, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H. Then in a linear format, like on a system like the MSX, the four bits would be together within one nibble. But within a bit plane system like the Amiga, the four bits would be in four separate bytes. And so each byte contains eight pixels of information, but only one of the bits for that pixel. So that's just a quick introduction to bit planes if it's not something you're familiar with. Now, that's not the most complex thing about the Amiga though. The Amiga has quite powerful graphics hardware and part of the reason for that is it has a second coprocessor which handles some of the graphical operations. Now, when it comes to setting up the graphics, we have to set up something called the chip registers. These are a wide variety of hardware registers that do all kinds of things relating to the graphics, the sound, and some other things as well. And we're not going to look at all of them. We're not even going to look at a fraction of them today because there are so many of them. But we do have to look at them to some extent. Now, when it comes to configuring them, some of them we can set directly just by accessing the ports. Each of them has a port number. They start at DFFF000 and they carry on down and you can see the numbers here. So we can, in some cases, directly just write data to those memory addresses and the effect will occur. But when it comes to actually controlling the screen position in memory and the colors and things, we actually need to use something called the copper coprocessor. Now, the copper coprocessor handles the graphics drawing and it can wait for certain lines of the screen and certain positions within the screen and change the orientation or the colors of the screen at those positions. We've seen this kind of thing before in the 8-bit systems on a system like the Enterprise, which has a lookup table, which does this kind of thing. But with the Amiga, we're actually effectively giving a set of commands to a separate processor, which is going to do the work for us. And so we need to work out what definitions we need to define our screen layout. And then we need to define a copper list and then give that to the coprocessor, which is going to draw our screen for us. Once we've got that copper list in action, though, everything's very straightforward. We can just write to areas in our memory and immediately those areas of the memory will appear as pixel data on the screen. So there's a bit of pain at the start, but once we get into things, it's going to be pretty straightforward. Forward. Now each command in the copper list contains four bytes, two words, and the structure of them is pretty straightforward. Now the first word in most cases will be the definition of the register we want to change. So it will be a number in this format here, and so we just enter the number we want to change and that will do the job for us. The next word will be the new definition for that register. And so we can select a register, give it a new value, and the copper processor will do this for us. The only other command that exists is a wait command, and the wait command will wait for a specific line. Now, we're not going to wait for a particular line. We're not going to change the colors halfway down the screen or anything clever like that. But we do need to create an infinite loop, effectively waiting for a line that never occurs. And this is the end of our copper list, and you can see it just here. So we set the top word to all Fs and the bottom word to FFFE, and that will define a, an infinite loop that will just end the copper list for us. Now, when it comes to actually defining the screen, we need some memory set aside for the bytes of the screen. Our screen's 320 by 200 and four bits per pixel. So we need approximately 32 kilobytes of memory there. Now, we can define this very easily with a DSB command, but we do need to understand that it has to be in a special place in memory. Now, on the Amiga, there are different kinds of memory. There is the basic chip RAM, which is the internal memory, and then there is upgrade memory, which is likely to be where our program is running. However, the graphics hardware and also of the sound hardware can't access that extra memory so we need to define a section in our code and define that to be chip ram so that we can gain access to the memory that the video display will be able to use so that's what we've done here we've started a chip ram section we've defined a bank of memory 
for our screen memory and we've defined a bank of memory for our copper list which is the set of commands that are going to create our screen. Now you'll see there's a rather unusual command here, this scene up command and what this does is it will pad a, the area of our data until it reaches a 32-bit boundary so we're starting a new long word and we need to do this to make sure our screen memory starts at a good position for the hardware. So we've got these scene up commands here just aligning the copper list and the screen memory and then we are able to use those within our initialization of the screen. Now the screen initialization routine is here. Unfortunately, it's quite long and complicated, so we're going to have to go through it in sections. Now the first part of the initialization does actually use the system firmware. Generally speaking, I don't like using the system firmware. I try and use the hardware registers themselves. But in this case, to my knowledge, we don't have any choice. So what we need to do is we need to open the graphics library and then start a new view. Now the way we're doing this is we have a definition of the name of the graphics library here and we are passing this via this GFX name here. We're then requesting this from the operating system and we are backing up the, G the GFX base here. Once we've got that definition we are loading in the memory address here and we're calling the load view command to start a new screen. At this point, we're now able to start actually defining the hardware definition of our screen. And we're using these chip registers now at this point. The first set of commands we can write directly to the chip registers. So we've got these definitions here, for example, for BPLCON0 here. You can see is just up here. And this is DFF100. Now, if we go back to our list here, you'll see... Here under 100 is BPLCON0. Now these have all had DFF taken off the front here, but they are the same things. The reason that DFF has been taken off the front of them is because that's how we actually address them when we are using them within the copper list. So the first thing we're needing to do is we're defining our screen. Now I'm using a 4-bit per pixel screen, so there's one layer with 4-bit planes. The Amiga can support up to 6-bit planes and it can have up to 5 on a single layer. So you can have a 32-colour screen or you can have two layers of 8 colours and there's various other combinations you can do. I'm only sticking to the simple 16-colour screen because my intentions with these tutorials is always to do things commonly on a multiple systems rather than really push the limits of one individual system. So, for example, by using 16 colours, we can very easily write code that works on the Atari ST and the Amiga at the same time. So now we've defined our bit plane, we are just initialising the position of the screen here, this is pretty generic stuff, and then we're turning on our screen here, enabling the DMAs. At this point we're ready to start creating our copper list. So what we're doing here is we're loading the label to our copper list, which you can see just here, and then we're going to start writing the bytes into there, which are going to define the screen. Now what we need to do is we need to take our screen, which is defined by screen memory, which of course is just here and we need to split it up into individual bit planes. Now the way we're going to define the layout of the screen is to have the entire screen's bit plane 1 as one chunk of memory and then below that the second one then the third and then the fourth. So effectively we will have the entire width and height of the screen for the first bit plane and then the second then the third then the fourth and you can see that in our calculations here. Our screen is 40 bytes across 200 lines tall and so we are calculating each of the offsets here for each of the bit planes. So we're moving this into D0, but then we're having to split it up. We're using for the first bit plane E2 and E0 here. Now once again, these are copper list registers here. So you can see E0 and E2 here. But because we can only define one word within each of these registers, we're having to split our 24-bit address into two parts. And the way we're doing this, if you look, is we are doing a swap command here to swap the two words of our longer round and we're moving one word here so we're effectively moving half of the screen memory address swapping the two parts around and then moving the other half you'll see here our first command here is e2 now this is a copper list command and you can tell this because all of the top byte is zero the bottom byte is of course the address we are looking to change so we're changing register e2 and we're changing it to the low 15 bits of bit plane 1, then we're swapping it around and we're setting E0 to the high part of the same address. So in this way we've set the first of the bit planes. We're then adding 40 times 200 which is the pixel size of our screen times 1 which for the second bit plane and doing the same. Then we're doing it times 2 for the third bit plane 
and then we're doing times three for the fourth bit plane. So at this point, we've now defined all of the bit planes that are going to define the pixel data of our screen. We're now going to define a default color palette here. Again, we've got register numbers here. These are the copper list commands to set the color registers. You can see them just here. Now we are going to look at these in a different lesson, so we're only going to quickly go over it here. But effectively, this is the command part here. So 0180 here is the command. And then here is the RGB definition here. So we've got standard definitions for all our colors here, and we're backing up the address of the colors within the copper list so we can easily change them later. And then finally, we've got that end of copper list command, which is effectively an infinite loop because we're waiting for a line that will never occur. When the screen has been drawn, the copper list automatically resets back to the start, so that will initialize the screen for us. Now we're waiting for a V blank, and once the V blank occurs, we are initializing our new copper list by loading the full address of the copper list into COP1 LCH, which is another hardware register just here. Now this will initialize the screen, and at this point our screen is actually drawn. So now at this point everything's a lot easier for us. All we need to do is write the data into our screen memory area here, making sure we understand our bit planes and we split the right colors into the correct bit plane locations, and that will do everything for us. So I think that's enough talk about the theory of getting the screen set up. Let's see what we're actually drawing today. So here we go, once again, as with all the other tutorials, we're drawing our Chibi Coast Bright to the screen and we've got a hello world message. So how do we do this? Well, as always, I am using my AcuSprite editor to export the data into the correct format to for today's example. This is free and open source, so please go ahead and get it if you like it. And you can use Save Raw Bitmap here to export this file in the format we're using today. Now, when it comes to actually plotting the data to the screen, as with the other times, we're using the get screen pause command to calculate the location within the screen memory that we want to start drawing to. We've got an X and Y position. We use this get screen pause and that will calculate that position for us. And then we loop around this code, which will actually plot the data from A0, which is pointing to our bitmap data that we export from AcuSprite Editor into the screen memory. Now, because we need to write all four bit planes, while in the file the bit planes are consecutive bytes, within screen memory they're actually the entire size of a screen apart. So we're calculating the correct positions for the four bit planes and using them as an offset to the screen memory location. So we're loading in a full byte from the source data and writing that to bit plane zero, auto incrementing A0 here of course. Then we're loading in another byte and we're loading it offset by 400 times 200 to get to the second bit plane. Now we're loading in another byte and we're writing it with an offset to the third bit plane and another byte offsetting it to the fourth bit plane. Now, of course, none of these are changing A6 here. So A6 is still in the exact same position as it was before. We're then incrementing A6, effectively moving along to the next byte within the line. And this will allow us to write the next eight pixels within the same way. We're then decreasing our writing counter by three because we've effectively written all four bit planes at the same time on the Amiga, whereas on the other systems, we would have only have written one potentially. So this rather odd layout is, is a bit quirky, but the ability of the 68,000 processors to do these offsets makes it pretty easy for us to work with. And then all we're doing is we're repeating to continue on the line. Once we've done an entire line, we're calculating the memory location of the next line and we're loop looping again until we've done our entire image. Now, when it comes to actually calculating the memory location that we want to write to, it's very straightforward. Now, because the bit planes are split out, our screen of 320 pixels is effectively just 40 bytes wide for each bit plane at least. So when we want to calculate a memory location based on an XY location where the X is in bytes and the Y is in lines, all we need to do is multiply the Y position by 40, because there's 40 bytes per line, add the X position and add that to the screen memory base, which is of course screen mem in our chip RAM. We do that and we and return, and that's given us the position that we want to start writing our byte data to within the screen memory. Of course, we do just need to do that offsetting to get to the other bit planes. And again, when we want to move down a line, all we need to do is add 40 to the current location, and that will move us down to the next line within the screen memory. So that's all pretty straightforward. Now, one last thing we do need to cover is the wait V blank. We did have to use that within our initialization, and the way we can wait for V blank is pretty straightforward. 
there is a register called vposr, we can read in from that. And if we end with this value here and then do a comparison here, then we will be able to test if we are in V blank or not. And so this is how I was able to slow down the Grime 68000 game to make it run at constant speed on the Amiga. And this is how we can wait and check if we are in V blank for if we need to reinitialize our screen. Now you can see there's some extra code in this here, and this is to do with my random noise generation for my sound effects code. It's not relevant to what we're looking at today, so please don't worry about that. So there we go. While it's quite difficult to set the Amiga screen up, relatively speaking, compared to some of the other systems, once we've got it working, we can really forget about all the complexity and just treat it as a dumb bitmap screen. Now, of course, as I've said, the Amiga is more powerful than that. It does have two layers and it does have some potential for hardware sprites as well. So we're possibly being a bit oversimplistic with our use of the Amiga here. But as I say, we're just trying to get in basic stuff so that we have a foundation to learn more advanced things later. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed this lesson today. Thanks for watching and goodbye.